Hello, welcome, and thanks for joining us here for our weekly seminar series hosted by the Living Earth Collaborative and Washington University's Ecology, Evolution, and Population Biology Group. This week, we have a real treat with not one, but two presentations from our very own graduate students, Marshall Wedger and Ari Miller. Because we'll essentially be doing two separate seminars this week, um, I wanna first alert you to the fact that we have a somewhat unusual format relative to our previous weeks. I'm going to first introduce uh, our first speaker, and then after his presentation, we'll take about five minutes of question and answer, and then we'll repeat the process for our second speaker. So what I'd like to impress upon you all out there watching from home is that you should not wait until the end uh, of the seminar to enter your questions in the chat section uh, on the side of your screen, you should enter them uh, as you think of them during each individual talk. So up first, we have Marshall Wedger. Um, Marshall joined us here at Washington University in 2015. And prior to that, he earned his BS in biology from the University of Minnesota at Duluth. Here at WashU, Marshall is working with Dr. Ken Olson in the biology department. Marshall already has put together a quite impressive record of research that includes a graduate research fellowship from the National Science Foundation, as well as four first author publications, including in highly regarded journals like the New Phytologist and the American Journal of Botany. Marshall's research, which I believe he's going to uh, take us through today, uh, looks at herbicide resistance and a common weed, and it has really important implications for both foundational topics in evolutionary biology, as well as applied topics in agriculture and management. Um, I think it's fair to say that here with the Living Earth Collaborative, we're all really excited for Marshall's seminar and even more excited to see where his research uh, goes uh, going forward. So before we get going, just one final reminder that we're first going to watch Marshall's seminar and then the question and answer period will come immediately after that. And then I'll move on to the second speaker. So again, please don't wait to drop any questions that you may have for Marshall in the chat and Matt and I uh, will relay them at the end. So without any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Marshall. All right, thanks so much for the introduction. Let me get my screen up and running. Okay, thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about one of my chapters of my thesis. Um, right out at the gate, I wanna thank uh, the people without whom this research just wouldn't be what it is. First, my co-authors, Nilda Roma Burgos up here in the top right, who lent me her expertise and the expertise of her lab to take me out on a collection trip and then do some of the herbicide resistance work uh, that I'll show later. Next, Ken Olson, who just wouldn't stop asking questions about the data and really turn this project into what it is. Thanks to the Olson Lab for the constant feedback, uh, Rice Tech for allowing us out into their fields and the NSF GRFP for funding. Okay, so as was mentioned, I'm a member of uh, the Olson Lab, and very broadly speaking, we look at questions um, in the genetics of adaptation, and I pursue those questions through the Weedy Rice system. So Weedy Rice is a, a close relative of cultivated rice um, that aggressively outcompetes um, cultivars of rice, as shown uh, in the picture over here on the right. So all of these light green plants, these are weedy rice plants um, growing above the dark blue green cultivated plants. Highly infested fields such as this can reduce yields by uh, more than 80%. And this reduction in yield in just this area of the Southern United States circled here on the map can reduce in uh, upwards of $50 million of losses each year. Historically speaking, there's been two strains of uh, uh, two dominant strains of weedy rice in, in U.S. fields. Here on the left is one strain, Black Hull Ond, um, and over here on the right is the second strain, Straw Hull Onless. Black Hull Ond has these really dark uh, hull colors and these long and barbed awns that help with seed dispersal. Straw Hull Onless, on the other hand, is much more, it looks much more like a crop mimic um, with these light colored hulls, um, and they're much shorter uh, in stature and they, they fit in a lot more in the fields. These two plants were in introduced into our rice fields about 150 to 200 years ago. Um, and since they got here, they've been evolving largely independently. They rarely interact with each other and they rarely interact with the cultivated rice um, that we grow here, at least historically. We know all this because of work that's been done uh, long before my time. So to orient you here in the rice taxonomy, <clears throat> first we have a rice of This is the wild ancestor to rice. It was domesticated either once or twice, doesn't really matter for our talk, but it was domesticated into sort of five varietal groups. 
On the left here, we have the indica subgroup, which confusingly includes the indica and aus uh, varieties. Over here on the right, we have the japonica subgroup that includes the aromatic tropical japonica and temperate japonica varietal groups. The US grows exclusively tropical japonica, shown here over on the right, this really well-behaved plant. And through a lot of the genetic work that our lab has done, um, we've identified indica, the indica varietal group as the direct ancestor of straw hull weedy rice. And we've identified the aus varietal group as the direct ancestor of black hull on group. Since neither of these uh, varieties were ever commercially grown in the United States, um, it stands to reason that both of these uh, uh, weedy rice strains were imported likely through contaminated grain stock from Asia. So here I'm showing the, the actual genetics behind those inferences. This is a structure plot. For those who aren't uh, familiar with structure, uh, each column is one sample. And the degree to which that column is colored one color or a different color is the degree to which structure, the program that we uh, that is building this figure, has identified that sample as being in one population or another. So for example, this, this um, individual here is about 60% pink. 40% red, meaning that it belongs 60% to this pink, to a pink group and 40% to a red group. Okay, so to walk through this over here on the left, we have wild rice. Wild rice plays no part in uh, the rice ecosystem in the United States. So you can mostly ignore that. Then the next five groups here are cultivated rice. Here in green, we have the aus varietal group. And then in pink, we have the indica varietal group making up the indica subgroups. Uh, in yellow and the blues, we have aromatic tropical japonica and temperate japonica. Again, tropical japonica is what we grow in the United States. These last two groups are the SH and BHA US weeds. Um, and the colors uh, can help you identify their ancestors. This pink group of SH belongs with this pink indica group. And the same can be said for the green BHA group. Um, being derived from this green house group. The last thing I'll mention before I move on is that these two, uh, the last thing I'll mention before I move on is that there's no evidence of admixture, uh, at least through the 90s, right? The, the three players in the US rice ecosystem, this dark blue, the pink, and the green, they don't intermingle. You don't see one color in with the other. And this is likely due to the very low outcrossing rates among uh, cultivated rice and weedy rice. It's well below 1%. Okay, but the title of my talk is uh, 21st century uh, changes in agriculture have shifted weedy rice. And these are those changes. Probably the most important change is the introduction of herbicide resistant cultivated rice. This was um, introduced under the moniker of clear field rice. It was introduced twice, once in 2002 and again in 2003. Um, and these cultivated herbicide resistant rice, they gain resistance through amino acid replacements at uh, this ALS gene, that stands for amino lactate synthase. Um, and it codes for a gene in the amino acid th synthesis pathway. And this is um, really important to plants such that if you block this protein, you it's lethal to the plant. This, uh, this technology, this clear fit technology, Clearfield technology has been highly effective and it's been uh, adopted at a, at a very quick pace. <clears throat> in 2013, about 45% of our fields grew some variety or some type of this Clearfield rice. And since then it's, it's plateaued at about 65% of our fields employ this Clearfield technology. The next shift in technology was the introduction of hybrid rice. Um, anyone who knows anything about heterosis would know, knows that uh, hybrid plants generally have higher yields than inbred plants do. And this is true in rice. But what's also true in rice is that uh, inbred, inbred rice likes to hold onto its seed really tightly. And we can take a combine through and we can get almost 100% harvest. Hybrid rice, on the other hand, doesn't do that. It doesn't hold on as tightly. And so some fraction of the seeds actually fall off the plant into the soil those plants grow up in the field the next year as what we call F2 volunteer rice. And it has these segregating alleles that lead to this very wide phenotype, phenotypic variation. These volunteer rice have this wide phenotypic variation. And that leads to um, 
this bridge of gene flow, right? These, this wide phenotypic variation leads to introgression from cultivated rice into weedy rice. And it's the combination of these two technologies, this really high uh, strength of selection for herbicide resistance and this uh, appearance of a bridge from gene flow, which has led to the identification of herbicide resistant uh, weedy rice. Um, and it's thought, it's hypothesized that uh, this weedy rice that has become herbicide resistant has become herbicide resistant through uh, hybridization with, cult with cultivated rice. Okay, so we had four questions for this study, um, but all four of them can kind of be underneath this one broad umbrella. How have the genomes of US weedy rice evolved since the early 2000s? That's the main question. First uh, sub question, is have SH and BHA contributed equally to the persistence of contemporary weedy rice? Uh, SH and BHA have um, coexisted for 150 years, um, growing right next to each other, not really interacting much at about equal frequencies. And we want to know, uh, has this changed? Has one become more important than the other? We just don't know. Okay, next, assuming these hybrids have a 50-50 crop to weed F1 genome, which is a good assumption, um, have the contemporary populations evolved a genome-wide bias towards one specific ancestral genome or the other? Um, a hypothesis from a genetic drift standpoint would expect that uh, on a population level, these contemporary weeds would still be about 50% weed, 50% crop. But if these contemporary weeds are, are experiencing any sort of selection, um, you would expect a shift in one direction or the other. Okay, third question, uh, does selection drive alleles of known function to high frequencies in a predictable manner? So weedy rice has been studied for decades and we know a lot about what genes are, and the alleles underneath those genes are important um, for this sort of weedy phenotype. And I'm gonna tell you two stories here, um, one where the cultivated allele would be selectively favored and one where the weedy allele would be selectively favored. And we wanna know, are those predictable? Lastly, we want to dig into this um, uh, herbicide resistance haplotype and ask what can this tell us about the last two decades of evolutionary history in weedy rice. Okay, so to achieve these questions, um, I went to Greene County, Arkansas in August of 2018, where I collected 48 contemporary plants. Um, we brought those back to WashU and sent them out for Illumina sequencing uh, at about 40x coverage. When we got those back, we pulled, pulled them with uh, previously published rice sequences, leading to a sample set of about 146 samples. Um, and then those samples led to a uh, SNP filtering, uh, a filtered SNP data set of about 19 million. Okay, so on to that first question. We took a population genetic approach to answer this question. <clears throat> This is another structure plot. So let's, uh, and, the sh and the colors have actually shifted. So let's, uh, let's talk through it for a second. So here on the far left, we have tropical japonica. This is the US crop um, and it's mostly this red color. Over here, this purple bin, um, this is the historical SH uh, plants. Right next to it is the BHA bin uh, in blue. <clears throat> These are the historical weedy rice and you can see that they're, they're very homogeneous. They're very much what they say they are. Everything to the right of that is the contemporary plants that I collected in Arkansas. And I think the first thing that'll pop out to you is that these are a mess, right? They look nothing like their uh, weedy ancestors. The inclusion of uh, this red color along with the purple and blue confirms that these are indeed um, crop weed hybrids. Um, and if you sort of play with this data for long enough, you'll split them into four uh, bins. So the first bin is the SH, what I've, what I've called the SH likes. These include any samples that had a significantly purple uh, portion of their genome. The next bin is the BHA likes. Um, similar to the SH likes, these are all those samples which had some significant amount of blue indicating uh, BHA as their weedy ancestor. The next bin, which I've called beta here, is gets a little bit more complicated. Um, but this bin is identified as a homogeneous and low diversity bin, which structure has placed in its own genetic subgroup. And we think the reason for this is that um, 
these are, we think, the very first hybrids. These are the ones that have been around the longest. So they have the lowest pairwise nucleoside diversity, they have the lowest genome-wide heterozygosity, and they have the highest FST, suggesting that they've been around the longest, where they've had the, the most generations of, of selfing, they've really like uh, condensed themselves and formed their own population. The last bin, uh, of which there's only a single sample, is this complex bin. Uh, this is actually a double hybrid. So it has genomic components of uh, tropical japonica, SH, and BHA. And the only way you can get that combination is through uh, at least two hybridization events. OK, so to answer our actual question, though, um, I think it's pretty striking that there's only 10 SH-like plants, whereas there's 37 if you include the betas. Um, and K equals 4 suggests that the betas are actually of BHA ancestry. There's 37 BHA-like, so 37 of our 48 plants are of BHA ancestry. And it, um, we don't really know how to explain this. We don't know why uh, there's such a bias towards um, the BHA likes. Uh, we think it might have something to do with um, F1 survivorship. If these SH likes just they're not very fit um, and they don't survive that first generation, um, it makes sense that there's fewer of them, but we're not entirely sure. The last thing I'll mention about this before I move on, um, the eagle-eyed among you might have noticed this sort of block of purple here within the SH likes. And these, there's four samples here. These four samples we know through other genomic analyses are not of hybrid origin. These are genomically pure SH plants that I collected in fields that are growing or that are spraying herbicides. And these plants, they're growing happily. So this should, this should jump out to you, right? So why are these four plants, why are they so happy if they're not of crop weed origin, hybrid origin? Keep these in mind, they'll come up again later. Okay, on to question number two, assuming this 50, 50 uh, genome split, how, has, uh, how have these populations evolved since then? So we took a local ancestry approach to answer this question. Local ancestry is super simple. So we have ancestor A and ancestor B. Here in this toy example, ancestor A, ancestor A has all Cs across this uh, locus. Ancestor B has all Ts across this locus. We then take a look at uh, a descendant of a hybridization between ancestor A. And as we move from SNP to SNP to SNP, we ask, does this SNP belong to ancestor B or ancestor uh, A? Um, and what we come up with is these large blocks uh, consistent with recombination. Okay, what I'm showing you here is only eight SNPs, but we can do this across entire chromosomes. Here I'm showing chromosome one, two, four, and seven of the rice genome. Up top, we have the BHA likes, and on the bottom, we have the SH like haplotypes. What I hope you'll agree with me uh, when I look at this, I see a sea of red with islands of blue. And this suggests a, uh, a weed like bias. So the red uh, indicates weed like ancestry. So this, this suggests a weed-like bias in our whole genomes. And as sort of a, uh, a, a nod to the future, I know it's hard to see, but right here in the middle of chromosome two, this is ALS. This is the gene responsible for herbicide resistance. And this gene happens to fall in one of these islands of blue, the crop-like ancestry. We suspect, we expect, that selection would favor the cultivated allele at this locus. And, and indeed, this is what it's, it's what is showing us. Okay, so not being content with just saying, oh, it looks like there's more red. We asked Loader, the software that we use to run this analysis to actually count how many calls went to ancestor A and ancestor B. And the upshot of that is that regardless of your ancestry, whether you're a BHA or an SH like, about 70% of your genome is constructed from your weedy ancestor. And I hope this makes sense, right? So um, after hybridization, these plants go back to growing in a weedy context. So it makes sense that the weedy genome might be favored, at least genes within the weedy genome that bring the rest of the genome along. Okay, so on to question number three. We took a look at genome wide and it went towards the weeds. What about at specific alleles? So I have to talk about those genes, uh, the genes we looked at quickly. We already talked about ALS. ALS responsible for herbicide resistance. 
um, and it came from the cultivated plant. So we expect the cultivated allele to be favored. The second gene we looked at is called RC. Without getting too deep into it, RC is involved in dormancy, seed dormancy, which is a very, very, very important trait. Um, very early on in uh, domestication, we broke dormancy such that when we plant a seed, it'll come up, it'll sprout. You can see how this might not be useful to a weed that wants to shatter into a field over winter and then come up when the environment is correct in the next year. This, this uh, trait is so important that in every world region that we see weedy rice, dormancy has re-evolved. And RC is the gene involved for BHA and SH. So we can expect selection for the weedy allele at this locus. Okay, first let's talk about uh, ALS. What I'm showing here is mean FST. FST is a measure of differentiation, such that a value of zero means these populations have not diverged at all. And a, a relatively higher FST means these populations have diverged quite a bit. So what I'm showing you here on top is the BHA-like weeds, on bottom is the SH-like weeds. <clears throat> on chromosome two, we have ALS. And what I'm showing you here this red line is differentiation between um, our contemporary weeds and their crop ancestors. The blue line is differentiation between uh, our contemporary weeds and their weedy ancestors. So in the case of the BHA-like weeds, those weedy ancestors are BHA. And at ALS, you see exactly what we'd expect. You see low differentiation between the crop and our, and our contemporary weeds, and you see high different, relatively higher differentiation between our contemporary weeds and the weedy ancestor. And this is suggestive of a selective sweep at this locus, which can be explained by selection for herbicide resistance. You see the same pattern at uh, the SH-like weeds down here. Okay, so the next gene we looked at, RC, uh, you see again exactly what we'd expect, at least for the BHA-like weeds. You see very low differentiation um, at RC between our contemporary weeds and their weedy ancestors. So they're recovering this dormancy trait. Very high uh, differentiation um, between our contemporary weeds and um, their cultivated ancestors. This uh, pattern is not recapitulated in the SH-like weeds. And we don't know why. Like I mentioned, this dormancy trait is very, very important. We think this might go some way in explaining why the SH-like weeds um, don't, don't fare too well. But we're, again, we're not sure. Okay, last question. Um, what can the herbicide resistance haplotypes tell us about the evolutionary history of weedy rice? So this is a standard haplotype tree. Um, the nodes here uh, denote uh, specific haplotypes <clears throat> and the size of the node and indeed the uh, sample names um, indicate how many samples uh, had that exact haplotype. And what I'm showing here are the 48 contemporary weeds um, and what haplotypes they have at ALS. So we went in and we excised the coding sequence of ALS and we're analyzing it here. Um, the color of the text represents um, to what extent that sample is resistant to the application of herbicides. And so uh, here we reveal two primary haplogroups. The top haplogroup is the weed-like haplogroup. That's all the way up here. The bottom is the crop-like haplogroup. The next thing this tree uh, reveals to us is clear evidence of, of adaptive integration. I mentioned Clearfield was introduced twice. Uh, we, we recovered two samples with the old haplotype. The haplotype was only here in 2002. It was, it was no longer grown after 2003. The vast majority of our samples have this contemporary Clearfield. This was introduced in 2003 and is still grown today. Um, it makes sense that most of our samples would have this haplotype. And um, this is clear evidence of adaptive integration from herbicide resistant cultivated rice into weedy rice. The next thing that this tree reveals to us is the sources of resistance, the molecular sources of resistance. So I pointed out before that these two haplotypes belong to cultivated or to clear field rice. And they're the two amino acid shifts that are responsible are, are these two here, G654E and one, new, or one amino acid upstream, S653N. These two um, go from a 
susceptible haplotype with one nucleotide change, you're all of a sudden highly resistant. But you'll notice there's more green text in this uh, figure than just these two. So we were curious how this resistance popped up. And wouldn't you know it, these exact two nucleotide mutations leading to these two amino acid substitutions show up in the weedy portion of our haplotype tree. Now this can be explained with adaptive introgression again, but I hope you haven't forgotten those four plants that were not of crop weed uh, hybrid origin, because these four plants are the four plants that are in the, the dashed boxes here. And so what we think we've found, and I think this is just so cool, what we think we found are two instances of de novo evolution of resistance through parallel molecular mechanisms. This is the exact same nucleotide mutating in two different contexts to lead to resistance. Okay, so just a very quick conclusion. Um, contemporary weedy rice has a clear BHA bias, clear BHA bias. However, um, only pure SH plants remain. We found no pure BHA plants. We found regardless of ancestry, about 70% of the contemporary weedy genome is weed derived, um, suggesting some sort of selective pressure. We found ALS and RC mostly behave as predicted by selection. And this might seem trivial, but this could be a jumping off point as we look at more genes with less clear uh, outcomes. And lastly, weedy rice gains herbicide resistance primarily through adaptive integration um, with cultivated rice, but it has shown its ability to evolve resistance um, by itself, de novo. Okay, thank you so much, and I'll take questions. All right, thanks, Marshall. That was a really fascinating talk. Um, I'm sure that everyone at home is giving you a absolutely <laughs> thunderous uh, round of applause. Um, uh, so I think I will lead off with the first question. And I guess the, the thing that strikes me about this is some of the applied implications of some of this work and what you might recommend to people that are trying to keep out some of these herbicide resistant uh, crops in their own sort of, uh, in their own crop plants. Yeah, so don't let me confuse you. Although this resistance has evolved, the actual incidence of herbicide uh, sorry, the actual instance of weedy rice has plummeted. These are these uh, technologies are highly, highly, highly effective as it stands right now. Maybe we'll see as the seed bank catches up um, that weedy rice reemerges at to these higher levels. Um, but as it stands right now, these clear field um, technologies they're doing great. Um, and this is just one herbicide. There's there's plenty. You know, it, I don't want to go down the, the, that rabbit hole, but there's a lot of herbicides that can be targeted. Really great. Thank you, Marshall, for a really, really fantastic talk. We have a question here from Lauren Johnson, who asks, were the four plants with de novo resistance collected from the same plot or from different plots? Um, they were, uh, so I didn't mention this, we went to five different fields and um, I made sure not to collect, uh, you know, within sort of sibling range. So those were the, the steps we took to, um, to get away from exactly that concern. Uh, they were actually collected at two different fields. Um, I presume, I don't have the data in front of me, but I presume, uh, you know, this, uh, these two were collected from the same field and these two were collected from the same field, but I, I don't have that data in front of me. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think we just have time for one more question. And I guess I, I was curious, so you, you collected these from sort of one kind of geographic region and I, I'm yeah. wondering the extent to which, you know, does hybridization or the rate at which there's outcrossing, does it differ sort of geographically uh, Sort of across the United States or across the globe, and might that um, influence kind of the instances of these sorts of phenomena? Yeah. So um, very quickly, uh, this uh, southern portion of the United States. This is the only place that grows. Well, there's a little bit of uh, cultivation in California, but we mostly ignore that because they they actually cultivate a totally different kind. They have their own weeds. Um, this is the only portion of the United States that that. Uh, cultivates rice and um, 
the, the quick answer is no. Um, outcrossing rates are just very, very low among cultivated and weedy rice. Um, every estimate is below 1%. The other thing I'll mention, you mentioned worldwide, um, wild rice doesn't play a part in the United States uh, because it's just not present. But in other areas of the world, especially in tropical Asia, that's where these things are native. And, and wild rice, uh, for one reason or the other, actually increases outcrossing rates in the whole system. Um, mm -hmm. it, it acts as this bridge of, of gene flow, this reservoir of things coming in and out and moving uh, between all the different uh, parts of the taxonomy. Um, and so in other world regions, especially in tropical Asia, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a much bigger deal. Really fascinating. Well, thanks again, Marshall. Um, yeah, thanks I imagine, so much. yeah, I imagine, uh, I imagine you're getting a, a huge round of applause from our, our viewers at home um, for what was a very excellent seminar. And as we uh, as we make the transition here, I'm excited to tell everyone at home that we have another good one in store. And so next up, we're going to hear from Ari Miller. So Ari joined us here at Washington University in 2020. Uh, before coming to WashU, he earned his BS in biology from the University of North Carolina at Asheville. During uh, this time, Ari was also a research fellow at the National Museum of uh, Natural History's Department of Vertebrate Zoology. Here at WashU, he's working with the Living Earth Collaborative's Jonathan Lossus on the genomic and phenotypic drivers of adaptive diversification. Uh, even just a couple of years into his PhD, Ari has already published some quite impressive empirical research and herpetological observations with first author contributions in systematic biology and ichthyology and herpetology. Today, Ari is going to be presenting to us some of his recently published work on key innovations and the drivers of biodiversity, uh, which you might have actually heard him recently talking about on uh, St. Louis Public Radio. So uh, again, before I turn this over to Ari, we'll have the same format for Ari's seminar that we did for Marshall's. So please leave any questions or comments that you have uh, here in the chat section on the side of your screen uh, as you think of them. And Matt and I will again relay the questions to Ari at the end. So uh, without, any, without delaying this any longer, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn, this, uh, turn the mic over to Ari. Well, thanks so much, Mike, for that very kind introduction and uh, many thanks to the Living Earth Collaborative for uh, facilitating these student talks today and specifically uh, Matt Austin for organizing these really fantastic LEC talks this semester. And uh, many thanks to Marshall for that really uh, uh, interesting talk. Uh, as Mike said, I'm a second year PhD student in the Lossos Lab here at WashU and I'm excited to share some neat macroevolutionary biology research I've, I've been working on for uh, the past few months. So uh, let's let's get right into it. So. Most broadly, understanding the relationship between the environment and the organisms that inhabit it have long been a central goal of biological research in the context of evolutionary theory, but also a wide range of subdisciplines in both evolution and ecology. And specifically, understanding and noting how organisms are particularly well suited for their environment, such as this uh, Racophorus uh, flying frog here from Southeast Asia that Wallace was uh, 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 so uh, lovingly described. Uh, has long intrigued folks uh, far beyond the evolutionary ecology research literature. Now, biologists and natural historians alike have long tried to untangle well, why is there such an uh, expansive array of adaptive diversity? And as a result, many different hypotheses have attempted to explain this widespread nature of adaptive diversity across uh, uh, the tree of life. And one of those hypotheses was posited by Alden Miller, a uh, ornithologist at Berkeley in 1949, and termed the key innovation hypothesis. Now, Miller's hypothesis was derived from examination and observation of ecomorphological divergence in bill shape and size between mockingbirds and thrashers. But the key innovation hypothesis is a general framework to explain adaptive diversity and, and global biodiversity patterns. And this has been reflected in the literature in some capacity uh, over, over the last few decades. Now, folks have defined key innovations in uh, a wide variety of ways, but Miller originally defined these characters as traits that fundamentally allow an organism to interact in the environment in a novel way. Now this theoretically encompasses release from some sort of pressure, it could, it could be uh, predation or, or parasitism or competition that consequently moves a lineage into a novel adaptive niche or adaptive zone that was previously unreachable without the trait. So perhaps the most popular expectation of key innovation evolution is adaptive radiation, which is a term we use to describe the process of 
evolutionary divergence of a single phylogenetic lineage into a myriad of ecologically adaptive and assortative forms. So one classic example of both adaptive radiation and the evolution of a key innovation rests in the cichlid fishes of the East African Rift Lakes, where the evolution of jaws in the pharynx have freed up the oral jaws from uh, uh, processing prey to allow them to specialize in various ways of catching prey. And we see that this has yielded a mass diversity of ecological forms of these cichlid fishes in these East African Rift Lakes. But of course, key, innovation or key innovations are a phenomenon thought to appear wide across the tree of life and stretch far beyond just acanthomorph fishes. Uh, and other classical examples include the evolution of floral nectar spurs and uh, angiosperms. And this has been thought to uh, promote uh, reproductive isolation through specialized plant pollinator uh, morphologies, or um, a personal favorite key innovation of mine is the evolution of elongated uh, lightweight or lightweight or pneumatic uh, cervical vertebrae and sauropods, the uh, largest terrestrial vertebrates to uh, ever ever walk the earth. Now, the previous examples of key innovations that I've, I've just mentioned share a common factor. That is, they've all presumably resulted in expansive adaptively diverse adaptive radiation. So these very speciose uh, and rich clades. Now this is very much in line with the way folks have long thought about how to test and examine the consequences of key innovations. And this has been done in two ways. That is examining species richness and diversification rate. Now this has been done in two ways. So first we can examine species richness through the lens of sister clade comparisons. That is where we can leverage the multiple independent evolutionary events or origins of a certain trait. So the idea here is pretty, pretty basic. If we have two clades where one clade has the derived novel trait and the sister clade does not, we can ask, well, is clade A, the trait brand clade, more speciose than clade B, the clade that does not have the novel trait. Moreover, as physical models have, have advanced and we've kind of become more nuanced and uh, comparative methods within phylogenetics, we've come to arrive at SSC models, which uh, put us in a similar spot in terms of understanding diversification but here we're directly estimating the parameters associated with diversification, that is extinction and speciation. So here we're asking, well, is the diversification trait influenced by the possession of trait X? Now, the long time assumption that a key innovation will kind of confer an increase in species richness has presented both conceptual and philosophical dilemmas to it. So first groups can become species rich Yet they can lack adaptive disparity. And a great example of that would be the woodland salamanders, the lungless salamanders of the Eastern United States. And second, lineages can explore novel adaptive niches without becoming species rich. So I'm gonna talk about this latter point just a bit. So across 66 million years of post-KPG mammalian evolution, we see that three different groups, so striped possums from Papua New Guinea, the II from Madagascar, and uh, an extinct mammal from the early tertiary of contemporary Germany, have arrived at a nearly identical but unorthodox and uh, uh, certainly weird uh, ecology and morphology. That is, all three groups are arboreal in nature and have evolved an elongated fourth digit that is utilized to dig out wood boring insects from the trees that they dwell in. So they hence kind of act similar to a, a woodpecker, both in their ecology and morphology. So this trait certainly allows these lineages to interact with the environment in a most novel way, yet all three of these groups have simply failed to radiate. So while a phenomenon consequence of increased species richness is fascinating, we must keep in mind that it is not necessarily always the outcome of key innovation evolution. So now evolutionary convergence upon a given trait, as demonstrated here with the evolution of this elongated fourth digit, provides a substrate to test our different hypotheses because we can examine the independent trials of evolution under broadly similar trait-based conditions. So now there are several key innovation systems that display ecomorphological convergence. Perhaps most notable to me, at least as an evolutionary biologist and herpetologist, is the evolution of sticky topads and lizards. Now, sticky topads are a proposed adaptation for living in trees and broadly their arboreal realm. And the benefit is fairly obvious, as demonstrated here by this day gecko hanging by a single toe. So if you live in a tree, you know, quite frankly, there are pretty obvious fitness consequences to falling out of that tree. So topads likely assist in evasion of these negative fitness consequences that may be encountered by a lizard living in a tree that does not have these topads. So to briefly detail just the biology of the systems, towpads allow organisms to vertically scale uh, uh, surfaces, perhaps not, not, not so easily traversable or manageable by lineages that do not have this adhesive capacity. So as demonstrated here, this unique functional morphology is actually facilitated by what are called lamellae that line the ventral surface of gecko skin canal 
toes. And if we get, take a scanning electron microscope and we were to zoom in on these lamellae, what we would see is a forest of what are called spatulate adhesive setae, which actually facilitate the physical and chemical process of surface adherence. Now, a both statistically and conceptually nice feature about studying key innovations through the lens of lizard toe pads is that they have independently arisen in three different groups. So first, the anole lizards of the neotropics, the globally dominant geckos, and the stunningly speciose skinks. Now, if you were to travel to a tropical forest anywhere in the world, you might be shocked at the diversity of pattering lizards that occupy the trees. You might have these giant day geckos in the forest of Madagascar, or weird geckos in Australia, or, or even weirder anoles in Northern South America. But perhaps even more shocking, if you're really interested in lizards like I am, is that there are hundreds of other lizards that do not have toe pads, but occupy trees and have evolved neat adaptations for living in trees such as long, sharp, curved claws or prehensile tails and so on. Um, so in collaboration with my great colleague here at WashU, James Stroud, we asked, well, how do we unravel the patterns that generated this diversity and how does it relate to the key innovation hypothesis? Well, if we want to understand how this diversity is generated, we need to capture most of it. So as a key innovation hypothesis is really a cohesive eco-evolutionary theory, a phylogenetic tree depicting the relationships between the relevant taxa is a starter. So here I'm displaying a family level phylogeny for lizards capturing extant diversity. So with respect to toe pads, the most relevant ecology might be the state of arboreality. That is, are lizards arboreal or non-arboreal? And do they or do they not possess toe pads? Now, for example, take a look at the, le at the leopard gecko. So natural history and morphological data tell us that this is a padless, non-arboreal species. So we add it to a row in the Excel data sheet. Next up, another species from the lizard tree of life, Anolis proboscis, that is our arboreal pad bearing species. So basically what we do is we work our way through the lizard tree of life, adding species to our data set. And eventually we ended up with a central database that describes the relevant ecological and morphological states for over 2,400 species of lizards around the world, or around 40% of extant diversity. Now, where do all these ecological data come from? Well, decades of natural history observations, that is folks going out into the field and observing and reporting on the ecology of these species. And this was collected and categorized by Shai Marie and Essential Database for other researchers to use at Tel Aviv University. So I'd certainly like to acknowledge that I'm really standing on the shoulders of, of, of giants here and that this research is enabled, enabled by those who've gone to uh, great lengths to uh, collect and collate these data into a central macroecological data set for other researchers to modify and explore. So here what I'm showing is the different colors represent the number of species, proportionally speaking, which exhibit a given ecological state. So either arboreal, semi-arboreal, or non-arboreal. But what you might notice is that there is a wide diversity of proportions observed. So some groups have uniform, all non-arboreal species. Some groups have entirely arboreal constituent species in some capacity and so on. So now that we've paired our evolutionary tree on the left here, over 2,400 species with ecological and morphological data, we can independently examine the evolutionary history of these traits. So now what you're looking at is a circular phylogeny reconstructing or inferring the ancestral state of towpad possession across 2,400 lizard species. And this allows us to infer the number of times towpads have been lost and gained throughout uh, their evolutionary history. So we're reconstructing or inferring the morphology as we go backwards in time. So what we estimate is that over 200 million years of squamate evolution, topads, which are depicted in blue here on the phylogram, have been gained approximately four times. So once in anoles, once in skinks, and multiple times in geckos. We also find that there have been several losses. Additionally, we find that there's strong phylogenetic signal. That is, if you're a lineage that possesses topads, it is likely that your evolutionarily close relatives will as well. So even though topads, topad gain may have happened only a, a handful of times, there is certainly a great diversity of morphological structures that comprise topads. Uh, and this is demonstrated by these wonderful illustrations from Russell and Gamble 2019. Fascinatingly, we find a very different pattern of evolution of arboreality here, which is denoted in that same shade of blue. So here I'm reconstructing the ancestral state or inferring that ancestral pattern of arboreality in squamate lizards, with blue denoting that high posterior probability uh, in, in, in squamate lizards of arboreality. And what we find is that the evolutionary history of arboreality is characterized by exceptional lability. That is, arboreality has been gained and lost across a lizard tree of life over a hundred times. So now that we have these two evolutionary histories for these two different traits, topad state and arboreality state, 
An appropriate question, given the tight ecomorphological linkage between these two characters, might be: well, What is the macroevolutionary relationship between toe, between having toe pads and being arboreal? So now we can further explore this question kind of in the context of the key innovation hypothesis. So foundational ecological and performance work and study of toe pads has certainly demonstrated their uh, functional superiority and definitely put them on the key innovation map. But now what we want to ask is, well, what is the macroevolutionary relationship between these two characters? That is the adaptive character in the adaptive environment beyond just changes in species richness. Well, if we reflect back on the seminal literature and uh, we can recognize that there have been several hypotheses posited concerning the evolutionary ecology of these traits. So Miller himself stated that key innovations evolved ex aptively, that is prior to invasion of the adaptive zone. Uh, Miller, on the contrary, said that key innovations evolved, uh, Simpson, on the, on the contrary, said that key innovations evolved adaptively, that is subsequent to invasion of this adaptive niche. And uh, Van Valen kind of philosophically posited that key innovations will commit a lineage to a particular way of life. So let's turn these into testable questions. So first off, let's address Miller and Simpson. Do these traits, topads, evolve adaptively following invasion of the functionally advantageous adaptive environment or exaptively prior to invasion? Next up, Van Valen is up at. So do lineages with the key innovation ever lose a trait while maintaining occupation of the same ecological environment? Lastly, a novel additional key innovation question. Do lineages that enter the ecological environment without the key innovation subsequently transition away to alternative ecologies at a more frequent pace than the trait bearing lineages. So how do we answer these questions? Well, we need to leverage what are called evolutionary transition rates or the rate of transition among different evolutionary trait states over time. So now recall that rates are merely quantifying change over time. So in this case of arboreal and pad bearing lizards, we have four different states that lizards could occupy discreetly. So arboreal padless, arboreal pad bearing, non arboreal padless, and non arboreal pad bearing. Now, what we want to know is what are the rates of transition among these different states? So we want to know what are the numbers behind these question marks? And this theoretically should shed light on these aforementioned questions. So to empirically estimate these rates, we have to estimate what are called evolutionary rate matrices to model these trait evolution uh, of the relevant compound states. So now what I'm showing here are these different index rate parameters. So these represent different rates. So for example, we may have a very little parameterized model where we constrain the estimated rate transitions to occur at equal rates between all states, or we might have a semi more parameterized model, for example, where we're saying, okay, these transition rates will symmetrically differ. Or we may have a very free model where we're allowing all parameters to free, to be free and saying, okay, well, all these transition rates will be unconstrained and are allowed to freely vary. Now you can see how this becomes complicated a bit quickly because you can open kind of this Pandora's box of tailoring our own biological hypotheses to constrain or enable certain transitions in these rate matrices. But the basis of it is that in the work provided here, we're mostly focused on these middle models, that is where all transitions can occur at a different rate. So this is the most parameterized model. Now for folks familiar with these sorts of phylogenetic comparative method approaches, I used a combined approach of hidden state models and the SSC framework and uh, the corn framework, as well as the uh, classical Pagel uh, correlated trait evolution models. And the first finding in the system when we plug our trait data and phylogeny into these, these models is that we find that topads, the key trait, uh, are rarely lost while maintaining arboreality. In fact, the loss of topads and non-arboreality occurs as high as 72 times higher than the rate of topad loss while maintaining an arboreal ecology. Next, uh, we find that topads have primarily evolved in arboreal lineages, such that the rate of topad gain in arboreality is actually between two and five times that of topad gain in non-arboreality. So this suggests largely an adaptive origin rather than a history of acceptation. So lastly, among various other neat transitions that, that, we, can, that we can observe, we find that padless lineages transition from arboreality to non-arboreality at a rate as high as six times that of pad bearing lineages. So what does this tell us about the evolution of key innovations and the key innovation hypothesis more broadly. Well, what we want to do is kind of revisit the initial eco-evo expectations posited by Miller, Simpson, and Van Valen that we initially posited in the beginning. So first, as evidenced by low transition rates from pad boring arboreality to padless arboreality, we find that lineages that evolve the key innovation rarely lose the key innovation while occupying the same ecological space. So if you're 
If you're a pad bearing lizard uh, living in a tree, it is unlikely that you will lose those toe pads and maintain arboreality. So next, given the high rate of toe pad gain and arboreality compared to non-arboreality, we found that the relevant character uh, here, toe pads, a key innovation, evolved largely via adaptation rather than exaptation. So addressing that Miller versus Simpson question. Lastly, we find that transition rate estimates to non-arboreality and padless and pad bearing lizards tell us that lineages that do not have the key trait transition away from the corresponding key innovation ecology to alternative ecologies at a higher rate than the key trait bearing lineages. So what we've kind of formed here is the conceptual framework for operator hypotheses for examining the macroevolutionary connection between evolution and ecology that extends just beyond measures of species richness, where we have certain expectations for the macroevolutionary signatures that key innovations may confer upon lineages that bear those traits and those that actually lack those signatures. So if the research described here uh, is of interest, please do check out the paper that was um, just recently published in Systematic Biology. And I think the work here uh, demonstrates value in really unifying or, or marrying ecology and evolution and reflection on key innovations. And we can ask some really neat questions with these uh, ever more nuanced uh, phylogenetic comparative methods, uh, pairing them with fundamental natural history and morphological data. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my brilliant co-author on this project, James Stroud, who is a current postdoc in the Lasso's lab, as uh, well as several folks who greatly improved this research, uh, uh, mainly uh, many current or past members of the Lasso's lab here. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. And if you're interested in collaborating on a similar project aimed at disentangling this trait environment key innovation relationship, please do reach out. I'd be happy to chat. Thank you. Awesome talk. All right, really interesting stuff. Um, so while we wait for some questions to, to roll in, we have a few, but I'll lead off with the first one. And, uh, and so it seems like you've, you've, uh, developed, a, you've sort of harnessed kind of older methods to test, a, to test an old idea in a new way. And, and that's really exciting. And I guess, uh, one question that I have is if you and James are starting to think about methods, um, and adapting the methods that you've employed here to kind of look at continuously distributed ecological traits next. That's a great question. Yeah, certainly. So, you know, for example, topads don't exactly exist on a discrete continuum always. So, so uh, you know, thinking about this in kind of more of a continuous framework is certainly the next step. Um, that's a great point, as in our framework is limited and that we're kind of plugging in these discrete traits um, and kind of coming up with a uh, both methodological and conceptually unifying framework for including those continuous traits, I think would be really insightful, especially for uh, getting those parameter estimates nailed down. Well, thank you, Ari. Really, really great talk. We have a question here from Yu San Ying, who asks, is there a negative relationship between grabby tails or prehensile tails and toe pads in arboreal species? And she's wondering because many of the examples of non-toe pad lizards you've shown seem to have it. Yeah, that's a, that, that's a, that's a great question, Yu San. So it, it is interesting that many of these arboreal lizards that don't bear toe pads have these peculiar adaptations for living life in the trees. And I haven't looked into that one when it comes to uh, prehensile tails, but uh, again, there's these great macroecological data sets out there that certainly would enable us to examine a question like that. Um, so that, that's certainly next up on the list uh, for folks interested in kind of pulling apart this relationship between not bearing toe pads and still living in this arboreal realm. So Suzanne Renner is wondering about, uh, I think some of the specific kind of older methods that people have tested the key innovation hypothesis with um, in, in your toe pad system and whether you see kind of the effects of toe pads um, on kind of species level diversification um, that, we, that we have seen in some of the other uh, key innovation kind of systems, but uh, she notes not in the nectar spurs. Yeah. So, so is, is, is this a reference to specifically the toe pad system? Or? Yeah. Do you see, do you see consistent effects on kind of lineage diversification at, following the evolution of the toe pads? Yeah. So in our paper, we actually did not find uh, uh, that net diversification was a significant role player. Um, but folks have independently looked at just toe pads, the, the differences in net diversification between lineages that bear toe pads and don't bear toe pads. That'd be a uh, Tony Gamble and company in 2012. Um, and they found slight differences, but um, I think uh, uh, the, the purpose of the research here was kind of to 
uh, move beyond that species richness comparison, although it certainly is a fascinating phenomenon that merits investigation uh, in itself as kind of a, a, a possible root or consequence of the evolution of a key innovation itself. But there hasn't been someone who's done like sister clay comparisons besides this, the uh, initial older kind of conceptual frameworks. Yeah. We have a question here from Caleb Axelrod. He asks, is it possible for a species to adapt to a novel niche without a key innovation? He's wondering um, about avoiding some circularity with determining what traits represent key innovations. Uh, for example, yeah, a... our... Oh, sorry, go um, on, he, he continues, for example, are sharp toes or prehensile tails also key innovations? That's a fantastic question, right? So it kind of falls in line with the argument that, well, are key innovations kind of just special adaptive storytelling. Uh, and, and, and uh, you know, that, that's been a real argument that's made throughout the literature. And I, I think that there are some, you know, certainly some valid criticism in that sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of pulling apart the difference between an adaptation and a, a key innovation. It can be different because those lines can be, can be blurred here. And certainly you could pick out a lineage and say, okay, well, this trait allowed the organism to interact with the environment in a novel way. And it kind of contributes to the blurriness of the definition in a way in that, uh, you know, like species concepts, there's really no operational definition beyond that increased certification uh, criterion. So it can be difficult, but um, I, I think it's something that folks are actively looking towards uh, kind of examining the uh, eco evo uh, feedback and, and not just the linear diversification uh, feedback. Really interesting. So we have one last question uh, before we wrap up here for you, Ari. Um, so Lauren Johnson is wondering um, if toe pads have negative consequences in a non-arboreal context. And she's sort of trying to think through why uh, why a lizard would ever actually go about losing its, uh, its toe pad seeming based on the, sort of the seeming benefits. That's a great question, Lauren. I'm, I've been thinking about the same thing. Uh, it's funny that you say that. It, it's interesting to, to kind of uh, un unveil that. And I think that this is the role that experimental biology has in uh, unraveling the uh, biology of key innovations. Um, um, if you have sticky toe pads, you can imagine that if you're traveling through a kind of dense substrate on in a terrestrial realm, that it could gum up your toe pads or, or something like that, or make uh, locomotion generally difficult uh, in these scenarios. And folks have been interested in, in, in testing these ideas and, and concepts in the field. And there's been a few folks out there who've uh, started doing that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's another great question, kind of tying in the uh, um, experimental biology to the macroevolutionary biology and these macroecological dynamics that uh, has, has yet to unfold, I think, in the literature. Awesome. Well, great job, Ari. And um, I want to thank you specifically again for giving a, a great seminar and thank both of you uh, again for agreeing to, to talk in our series. And uh, we're really, really grateful and really fascinated by the work that you all are doing. And so uh, I'll wish the audience uh, farewell and, uh, and we'll, we hope to see everybody next week.